My name is Derek Rosendahl, and I'm a postdoctoral research scientist with the South Central Climate Science Center. Today, we'll be discussing what a global climate model is and how it works. Scientists use models to represent a number of things, such as objects, concepts, or systems, in order to gain a better understanding of them. But the term model can mean many different things, from a physical model of a watershed to examine the movement of sediment in a river, to a statistical model of the relationship between consumers' interest and the type of vehicle they buy. In the case of a global climate model, we are referring to a numerical model that runs on a powerful supercomputer. The lines of the computer code describe what scientists know about the physical processes that occur in the atmosphere, ocean, biosphere, and land surface. Fundamentally, these processes represent how heat, moisture, momentum, and chemicals move across space and through time. Imagine trying to simulate the continuous Earth system in a computer model. Global climate models work by dividing up the Earth's atmosphere, oceans, land, and sea ice into lots of three-dimensional boxes or grid cells. Modern global climate models can have grid cells that are 50 miles squared in the horizontal and that can go up to 90 levels in the atmosphere and down to 60 levels in the ocean. Most common global climate simulations begin at an initial state resembling the beginning of the 20th century and then respond over time to changes in the Earth's energy budget by processes such as the amount of incoming solar radiation or atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases and aerosols. Using equations for the basic laws of physics, fluid motion, and chemistry, variables such as temperature, precipitation, wind, moisture, and pressure are solved at each of the grid cells and are able to interact with each other across space and time. For example, the winds may be blowing colder air into a region, so over several time steps, the temperature at a given grid point would decrease because the computer calculates where the wind field moves that colder air mass. When we visualize the results or output of these global climate models, it is sometimes difficult to tell the difference between the model output and actual measurements from satellites, weather stations, or other observing systems. That's how good today's global climate models are. The current generation of global climate models includes the physics that represent how radiation is transmitted, reflected, and absorbed within the atmosphere and at the Earth's surface. They represent clouds, rain, and snow, evaporation of water from the oceans, transpiration from plants, the movement of water into the soil, and ocean circulation around the globe. They can generate tropical storms, cold fronts, jet streams, and trade winds. They can also release sulfur dioxide through volcanic eruptions or absorb carbon dioxide in the oceans and forests. Essentially, all of the major drivers of our climate system are represented in the current generation of global climate models. Some processes are either too small in size or too short in duration to be modeled well. In these cases, simplified representations of these processes, called parameterizations, are used. Individual thunderstorms are one example of these small-scale phenomena. In these cases, modelers represent the physical impacts of these processes, such as the exchange of heat and moisture between the small scale and the large scale. Global climate models typically include parameterizations for processes such as small-scale vertical motions or convection, turbulence near the Earth's surface, development of cloud droplets, raindrops, and snowflakes, and molecular interactions with solar and terrestrial radiation. Although global climate models have seen significant improvements over the last few decades, they still are not perfect. No model can exactly reproduce our complex climate system. There are still physical processes in our climate system that scientists are trying to better understand, and as they do so, that knowledge will continue to be incorporated into climate models. When you think about the increasing complexity of the represented processes and the millions of grid points needed to cover the Earth's surface, atmosphere, and oceans, you realize that the computer power needed to calculate thousands of equations over hundreds of years is immense. That is why global climate models need to run on supercomputers. In fact, we use some of the fastest computers in the world to run our global climate models. With all that needed computing power, why do we even model the climate in this way? The main reason is that we are trying to understand how atmospheric processes and feedbacks impact our climate system, especially in areas where there are few measurements, such as in South America or Asia. We also can learn about our climate system by making changes in the model and seeing how those changes affect the climate. Since we only have one planet, we can't learn about how our atmosphere works by conducting lab experiments on it. We must model it instead. We also use climate models to measure the influence humans have on our climate. We do this by running the models with and without man-made greenhouse gas emissions in what are called fingerprint studies, and then compare the similarities and differences in the results. Finally, and perhaps most importantly for decision makers, is that we can use climate models to project what our future climate may be. Global climate models are the most important tools for showing us that our future climate depends on the decisions we make today. Without global climate models, we would not be able to manage for our changing climate.